Hello, and welcome back to Making the Jump, a video series about innovation in digital higher education. I'm your host, Justin Hudson, and in today's episode, I have the privilege of interviewing and having a conversation with Shauna Chung. If you don't know who Shauna Chung is, you should, and stick around, you're gonna get to know her a little bit better. Um, But Shauna is an amazing speaker, and uh, I've seen her give presentations on digital literacy and digital creativity at a number of venues, and I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation with her today. Uh, Shauna is currently a graduate student at Clemson University, where she is pursuing a PhD in rhetorics, communication, and information design. Um, She has led workshops and webinars on digital literacy and digital communication, and she's been an invited speaker at numerous events, including being the keynote at the 2019 Innovate Conference at Ohio State University and and being a regular featured presenter at Adobe's Edumax. So it's with that in mind that I I thought Shauna's a great person for us to have a conversation with. So I want to bring her in and uh, get her thoughts on these things. Shauna, is there anything I left out, anything that I perhaps overlooked or missed uh, in my introduction about who you are and, and the sort of great space you occupy in the world? You did great, Justin. Oh, thanks. Overselling <laughs> it. I like that. So, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about in our show or in this, this series is particularly we're looking at digital literacy and digital creativity, um, mm-hmm. but also considering, you know, how these things impact innovations in higher education. And I know the scenario that you worked in, which is why we have you on today. And so I thought we'd start with an easy sort of um, approach, uh, thinking about what is maybe your view uh, on digital literacy and digital creativity, or uh, maybe framed another way, what is the importance for you, or importance you think anyways, of digital literacy and digital creativity in the classroom uh, for Mm -hmm. students today? Yeah, so I think before I answer that question, I should probably situate my response just a little bit. So I'm coming from a humanities perspective, specifically like a writing classroom. Uh, I'm also a lowly PhD student, so I'm still very much figuring all of this out. Uh, And so I I teach uh, first year composition. I just taught technical writing this semester. So still trying to figure out um, how to incorporate digital tools into those those classes and things like that. Um, But yes, my response will definitely come from like this humanities perspective. Right, right. So I've, I've heard digital literacy really used as a buzzword. It's like this thing that people are like, oh, you know, we live in this very media saturated environment. Digital technologies are the future. We need to get this in the hands of students. And so you'll just hear like digital literacy, digital literacy, and nobody really knows what that means, I think, because we're all very much figuring that out and, and trying to invent with it. And so I've, I've heard a lot of people say that it's this cutting edge thing. And so then it, it brings three different responses that I've, I've noticed. So you have the enthusiasts who are definitely there. They're on the cutting edge. They're early adopters. They're so eager to incorporate this stuff into the classroom and they know they're practitioners themselves. And I think that for them, it's just this very natural transition in terms of knowing how to incorporate that into the classroom. Then I think you also have these digital literacy admirers who know that it's important, but don't necessarily have a lot of experience personally. And so then all of a sudden they'll be just saying, you know, our students are gonna make video essays. We don't know how to do that, but they're gonna do it. And then I also think that you have the skeptics who are just saying, you know, we can't just abandon tradition. And there are a lot of things in this old form or the, the more traditional way of thinking that is, worth keeping. And after reflecting on those kinds of responses, I see value in all three. And I think right. that it's possible with digital technologies to, to use a Victor Vitanza uh, metaphor instead of being against, to be against, like to, to work alongside. And right, right. I, I really think that that is possible in using digital tools. Okay, so I see this a lot, uh, you know, in terms of faculty who have been teaching for a while, and they have a lot of tried and true practices for their field, mm-hmm. for their degree, for their purposes, for their students. And so the, you know, it's not that they're always necessarily hesitant to change and adopt digital literacy, because they see mm-hmm. the value. It's just that I already do this thing that works, right? right and and, right. and so um, one of the things I've been pointing out uh, more and more lately is that that may be true that it that it does in fact work, but uh, you know we have more and more students coming from a mediated sort of a, uh, worldly experience, right? They spend uh-huh. 14 hours a day on screens and TV and tablets and things. So if they expect mediation and your class is absent of that as a critical learning value, you know then then what do we do? Are the students going to balk at these sort of maybe more traditional sort of frameworks or you know is it uh we're trying to give them skills in a given field so i'm always a little uncertain how to how to how to position it beyond like well students are changing (laughs) you know but students have always been changing so that's that's not necessarily the best answer um but i think i think you're right in terms of you know how do we break down 
what does the buzzword digital digital literacy mean and mm -hmm. how does it get taken up uh, in classrooms? And it's, uh, it's, I don't know, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, right from information literacy to computational literacy to working with media to, uh, mm -hmm. oh, you know how to communicate online, right? So, so, <laughs> I'm, so what do you do then, uh, since you, in fact, do teach things that are related to digital literacy, how do you, how do you bring that into the classroom? Or you know, maybe what are some of your particular strategies to help students think about this as a framework beyond just how do we talk about it at the higher education level? Yeah, so I think for me, what I had to do first was become acquainted with or to become digital literate in, in some capacity myself. So really starting with production on my end and then figuring out how to maybe incorporate that into the classroom was how I, I started with everything. So something that uh, I think is helpful in terms of bringing these things into the classroom is just thinking about what is creativity and what is its place in my work and then also in, in academia in general. And I think what's really useful is, um, yes, can you tell I'm, I'm reading for my dissertation exams? <laughs> so yeah, uh, Gregory Ulmer, he wrote, he wrote this book called Heuretics and it's all about invention. If you're, you're very familiar with this, um, yeah. with this text, but on page six, he says everyday adult existence organized by the demands of practicality has suppressed all other modes of thought. Later on in the paragraph, he says, an inventive culture requires the broadest possible criterion of what is relevant. And so for me, that meant that I, need to, I needed to start thinking with these other modes of thought, these things that I think that have been suppressed, especially in an academic context. And so what this did for me is it helped me see that everything is valuable, like the mundane stuff, the everyday, stuff, all of those things can be used in service to, you know, to create and to invent. And so, yeah, it just brought this value to the, the everyday that I didn't think could be brought. Uh, yeah. So what, what ended up happening was I, I started to interact with my environment in completely different ways. Like I would be walking down, um, you know, just on campus. And then all of a sudden, if I know that I need to make a video or something, or I'm trying to look for some sort of visual metaphor, just looking at cracks in a sidewalk or looking at, you know, leaves falling down or um, seeing, I don't know, a, a collection of ladybugs in a corner that became valuable to me. And I, I started filming those things and seeing what I could do with those types of things. And then when you pair that with some sort of academic idea or something that is outside of, of yourself, you're able to just marry this other mode of thought with the traditional academic stuff and create something that is totally new. And, right, right, right. and so letting students have the ability to um, experiment in those ways is something that I've I tried to do. But it all began with kind of experimenting with it myself first. Right. No, I, uh, I had a very similar experience in that um, the more I started to discover about how I work with different mm -hmm. tools and technologies, the more, uh, one, I became critically aware of things in the world that would contribute to that. And then yeah. two, how I might situate that for students. So, I mean, you know, I wasn't formally trained in, in these things in any particular order. Um, but as I started tinkering with video uh, and image design and things like that, I became, again, just a, a, acutely aware of how color worked or how shadow worked mm -hmm. and then or how pacing and, and space works and then then I went back and would do some research on like oh why does this work in film why does this work in design yeah. uh, you know so I sort of back back track through all my knowledge if you will mm -hmm. um, uh, but but it's it's very important that you know for me it was at least that the more I became comfortable with experimenting with these things mm -hmm. uh, the the more I was able to then allow students to experiment with those things right. because I knew the struggles. And I think that's true for a lot of faculty, but there is a certain um, fear in mm -hmm. trying something new or making time for something new or, yeah. or what if I do this and it doesn't work at all, Shauna, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, then right. what, right? And uh, uh -huh. what if my teaching evaluations suffer? And, and um, so, you know, for me, I'm always, I'm a big proponent of failure as a core value of how I teach. Absolutely. Uh, and so, and so I'm like, well, I would rather take the risk and fail miserably with the students mm -hmm. than, do something that I'm not, I'm not sure that I believe in, right? Uh -huh. And um, not that faculty do that kind of thing, but that was always my mindset. So I started, like you, I, I started tweaking things and taking photos and capturing images. And, you know, I'd often imagine like I'd walk into a building and I'd have this sense like, what would be the music playing behind me as I walked <laughs> into it, right? You know, um, and yeah. I have a, a lot of MTV memories going on. So there's that. Um, <laughs> 
but you know, so I think, I think it's a great start. Uh, but so once you got a handle on that, what were some of your very specific things that you started to do with students? What did you, what's your like, what was your first real digital creativity engagement with the, with students or, or meaningfully so, right? Yeah. So because I was experiencing, uh, these things as a student myself and was recognizing the value of, you know, re-seeing these academic concepts through the lens of a camera or something like that. Yeah. I got super excited and I was just telling, uh, I started thinking, how could I bring this into my first year writing classroom? And so one semester I decided that instead of a traditional research paper, I would open it up for, you know, like a video or a podcast or something. And I thought that I could just give students the option. I didn't yeah. think that I needed to really do too much training because I thought like they've got this, they, they're probably way more digitally literate than I am. So one of my students said, you know, I'm really excited about making a video because I watch a lot of YouTube and I think that this would be something that I would really enjoy creating. And so I was excited because he just seemed so excited. So I was like, just go make something like go create, go crazy. Cause you know, like find value in a crack on the sidewalk. <laughs> Things yeah, like yeah. that. Um, and I thought that I could just like let them free and let them figure it out themselves. And I actually have um, an example of what ended up happening, like a before and after situation. The battery has become the common trend in America, but many batteries are unaware of the harmful effects that can result in these batteries. Some of these batteries require people to avoid certain filters or to take some medical filters, vaccines, diabetics, and other supplements. These diets are believed to toxify the body to promote weight loss, but they are not supported by credible sources. Instead of following the latest diet craze, potential dieters should follow the recommendations stated in the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Okay, so as you can see in this example, the audio is very, very quiet. It's basically just a bunch of still images and a voiceover. And so I started thinking to myself, all right, the student is super motivated. The student is very, very excellent in all things. Um, he doesn't cut corners. And so what is going on here? Um, because it, yeah, it just seemed like a traditional yeah. essay. There was nothing, I guess, super innovative about, about the submission, but I knew that he, um, yeah, he's super smart and yeah. And this was not, right? That were telling me. So like this, this <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, but I, I don't mean that as a, not a knock on him, but like it, your expectations of his work was so much better than what this ended up being the first time through, right? So it's, it's a, there's something that was um, needed to be reconciled uh, in, in that disjunction, right? Right. And I, I think just because he spoke so highly of YouTube and was like showing you videos that he, really admired. Uh, I just thought that maybe it would be something similar to that kind of a style. Yeah. Um, but I think that what I ended up seeing was something a lot more traditional. It was not breaking the bounds of like a traditional essay. So then that this experience really taught me, you can't just tell students, like, go make a video. You have to be very deliberate about scaffolding those skills and um, those aptitudes in the classroom. And so what ended up happening was we started watching more um, example videos and breaking those down. Like, how are they using sound here? How are they incorporating visual metaphors? How um, are those things uh, pairing together with your script? How do you speak your script in a more engaging way? How do you up the quality of your audio? Little things like that, that you think aren't really important. Um, once you start producing video and you recognize the rhetorical impact of quality sound or um, of a strategically delivered script or voiceover, I think your relationship with digital elements completely changes. Um, and so this was the after. Dieting has become a common trend in America, but many dieters are unaware of the harmful effects that can result from these diets. Some of these diets require people to avoid certain food groups or to take certain medications such as laxatives, diuretics, and other supplements. These diets are believed to detoxify the body to promote weight loss, but they are not supported by credible sources. Instead of following the latest diet craze, potential dieters should follow the recommendations stated in the 2015 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans to live longer, healthier lives by preventing many diseases from occurring. It's a good improvement, right? That's great. 
Yeah, after he watched a bunch of tutorials on his own to just figure out how to make the quality of his audio a lot higher, um, he incorporated more stock footage that was moving instead of something that was just still. And he was able to articulate why he did all of those things. And at the end, he still had that static image, but he said, this is my thesis statement. I don't want anybody to be distracted by any kind of audio cue or some sort of visual cue. And so I want it to just be straightforward and I want people to just focus on my voice. So the fact that he was able to articulate at that at the end, um, yeah, just really spoke to his understanding of how to use other modes, other modes of thought in more strategic ways. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, so the one thing that, um... I, I, I enjoyed this piece, but he took out the, the image with the girl eating the spoonful of pills. <laughs> I was like, and I really liked that image. I was like, man, that's such a great, so powerful, right? Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's eventually I assume that's what we're all going to be like. There'll be no food. We'll just take pills and be done. But um, exactly. Okay, so that, that's, I mean, that's perfect. Um, so then, you know, okay, so you've got, you're bringing the video, you're giving them, Initially, you turn them loose, but then now you realize you have to have scaffolding and work with intentionality. Um, and of course, that requires you to learn a little more about how the videos work so that you can help them understand more about that. But you know, uh -huh. the, at least you're willing to try the first time and realize maybe I need something else, right? Right. Um, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, so now that you have had this glorious experience and have taught and, and probably had similar experiences across a number of different kinds of media, um, uh -huh. what might be some things that you could offer other people, right? Uh, some key steps or principles and takeaways that uh, folks who might want to look to get into doing more digital literacy uh, or digital creativity, pedagogical kinds of things. Uh, obviously, I think scaffolding is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so, what? How would you? How would you tell the novice, the new person, the maybe the experienced educator, but new uh -huh. to these tools? Like, here are some things you might want to consider, or you might want to do going into this process. So, one of the first things that I think that um, educators who are just kind of starting to incorporate digital tools into the classroom, what they can do is first be resourceful and to reward resourcefulness. I think that it's really important to recognize that teachers can't teach everything. I mean, sometimes we, I think it's also worth knowing that, or worth thinking about teachers or educators in the same way that we view students. Because we say, you know, students come to the classroom with different aptitudes and proficiencies and experiences and things like that. And I think a lot of times we forget that educators are in the exact same place, in the exact same position. And so just understanding that even though we're all teaching similar courses, that we're approaching them differently, how do we achieve those same goals, but do it in a way that is unique to us and that makes sense to us. I think one of those first things, especially for wanting to become more digitally literate in the, in the classroom or promoting more of those ideals, um, is to be resourceful and to reward resourcefulness. Just saying, I don't have all the answers, but there is Google and there is YouTube and there are definitely resources that exist out there and it's up to you to figure that out. One, one semester, I had this one student who, well, I know that a lot of times students will just email you like the simplest things and they'll be like, you know, how do I upload this? Or what do I need right. to turn in and stuff? And all your instructions and everything have been announced in class. They're on you know, Canvas or whatever online portal you use. And still they're, they're asking these questions. And I have this one student, I think he was emailing me around 11 PM, but I, I didn't get the message until the following morning. And so he ended up having to be resourceful, uh, not by choice. And right. so he was calling, um, Adobe actually, because he was trying to figure out how to use Adobe Spark. And so he went through this long process of just trying to figure this thing out and he figured it out. And so the next day he, he was sharing this with me before class and I was just blown away by the stuff that he took on his own to figure out his problem. And so instead of just being like, oh, you know, that's great. I had him share that with the entire class. I told him, explain your process, explain what you had to do and how you did this all by yourself. And he did. And from then on, Students in my class didn't really have questions about those nitty gritty things because they realized I can I can have agency over this this issue and I can figure out how to do that. Um, and I think that, that that takes the pressure off of instructors to be the experts in all of those things because we're not we're still figuring this out. So that's the first thing is to be resourceful and to reward resourcefulness. Another thing I think that is valuable is to incorporate workshops or point students in the direction of tutorials, or at least give them a place to start. Because again, 
even if we're not totally familiar with how these softwares work, um, I think bring people in who know, whether it's through your library or your information technologist, or even just um, finding tutorials online or showing students that tutorials do exist, giving them those kinds of resources, I think is extremely important. And that just requires a little bit work on the instructor's end to figure out what that is. They don't need to, again, have watched all of them. They don't need to be totally proficient in knowing how to run those workshops, but just having those resources available to students, I think is, is very important and super helpful. Um, another thing is to build in time for feedback and trial and error. So this semester I was teaching technical writing and I wanted to start with a bunch of multimodal projects that would lead into like the more traditional white paper report like that type that type of thing. So I had them just kind of flex their creative muscles in the beginning. And what I tried to do was build in actual just weeks for feedback and demoing. And it ended up going pretty well because what we did is the first week we would kind of vision cast. I would show them examples of exemplary projects or things that you know, maybe could be worked on and we would identify ways to improve these, these projects and things that maybe we uh, admire that we could take in terms of like rhetorical strategies and apply to our own work. Then after we vision casted, then we would go through like the nitty gritty stuff. It's like, here's how the software works. Like here are some tutorials that you can use. And then I just had them create something like a 30 second demo. And they would share that either in groups or um, for the podcast, um, I, had, I had to make podcasts. Yeah. And uh, some of my students, I asked if there were any volunteers because some students work way ahead of time. And yeah. so I had them just, everybody sat there and listened um, to these, these student work. And so it not only inspires their peers, but it also gives us all a, a chance to, to feel like, you know, we're in this together and we're giving you feedback and, uh, you don't have to have a perfect sample here. Like we're giving you feedback so that you can continue to improve your work. And so right. failure is not failure really. It's like the beginning of this process, this creative process. Right, that's great. Yeah. No, that's, those are perfect. I mean, I do uh, oh, create some yourself. This is your last one, I like this. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, I think it's super worth creating something yourself. Whether you're an instructor or you're a student, I think that just engaging in that creative process is really valuable. Because if we're asking our students to do the same, I think it, we owe it to our students to engage in that process ourselves. And what I've observed is like, you don't have to make a documentary film your first time around. You don't even have to make a video necessarily. It's just opening up an application and seeing like how some of the buttons work. That, that alone I think is, is valuable. And it doesn't have to be the most complicated one. It can just be something uh, on a basic level, just to understand the logics of production. Yeah. You know, so one of the things, uh, sort of work backwards, because I like, uh, these are great, by the way. Uh, one of the things that I do, or that I encourage people to do is it's uh, called enacting the paradigm, right? So um, if you are, if you're going to have students create a video or you want uh -huh. them to do a video, you should make the assignment handout as a video. Yeah. If you want to, if you want them to do, make a web text, you should, you should make it at, you should create your own web text to explain the assignment. Uh -huh. um, and, and just that simple thing, not only reinforces the work you're doing, but it, for it sort of, necessitates that the faculty member or the teacher, or the instructor, or whomever um, has gone through at least some of the process to say, exactly. oh, this is the weird thing to go on when you're trying to edit a video or yeah. I can't, I can't, why can't I download this clip from YouTube? You know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And so I think uh, I can't, I, I agree. I think creating your, something yourself is, um, it's an important part of the process. Absolutely. And the more you can do it, the, the better, I think you position yourself to respond to student issues. Oh. Right. Um, yeah. But I really enjoy the uh, the first one, be resourcefulness, uh, resourceful and reward resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. I every semester this happens, right? Where um, I try and find more things to give them examples or mentor text or uh -huh. hey, here's a tutorial. But inevitably they come up with problems that make no sense and I can't solve. Mm -hmm. And so then we we collaborate or they do it on their own to figure mm -hmm. out here's my workaround, here's my solution. Yeah. You know, um, and some students are always hesitant to what I want them to do. I don't mm -hmm. know if you had this too, but like they wanted I wanted them to make. Um, uh, and a sto digital storytelling was one of my assignments, this, this digital narrative. And uh -huh. uh, they were supposed to use Adobe Spark page to create this. Okay. But a couple of students mm -hmm. didn't want to use it. So they created, they went and learned Wix.com oh. to create their own version. And the irony of all things is they made their Wix.com page scroll and look exactly like an Adobe Spark page. Wow. Right. Like, and so, I mean, it scrolls and functions and exact, I'm like, well, why did you go through all the trouble of, of doing that? And they said, well, they just like the interface of Wix better. Uh -huh. And, and I don't, I'm not, I mean, that's to each his own, but 
I was just, you know, I was like, okay, that's congratulations. It looks like it's supposed to look. I don't, I don't, yeah. know, I don't know what to do with that. Um, uh-huh. But, uh, but I think, I, so I think that's a, a great point um, in terms of how do we think about who solves the problem, right? Yeah. Instructors increasingly feel that they need to be the one to solve the problem, but mm-hmm. I try and stay out of the way. I, I give students less and less and expect more and more from them. Uh-huh. Um, and it, you know, that's just my own, maybe it's not right, but that's what I do. And so, <laughs> and so uh, I think it works, right? I think it works as a workshop model. I think it works as a feedback structure, mm-hmm. you know, pulling back a little bit and asking them to do the work or figure things out or answer questions to each other is, has been one of my favorite uh, learning strategies. So yeah, um, it works great. Yeah. And to just kind of echo what April was saying in the the previous episode, which everybody should watch because April is amazing and her responses were very profound. Um, But she was talking about how this this whole process kind of unlocks a creative voice that you don't really know that you have. And I think that when students start engaging in this, this is not where they're just like, oh, I hate this. Or even as an instructor, like, oh, I hate watching these videos. Like, this is so tedious. Sometimes it is. Yes. Like, sometimes there's going to be a learning curve. But more often than not, it allows you to just bring what is in your brain, like th- these, these, um, yeah, this vision you have in your brain to bring it to life. And yeah. to be able to do that is so empowering and it's also really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we, you know, one of the things I stress all the time is that um, the more students develop abilities across these different modes in media, mm-hmm. right, the more you fundamentally um, expand their capacities for expression. Yeah. And, you know, our ability to, to think and our ability to express that thinking are fundamentally related. So, you know, the more options I give them to try and communicate what they are seeing or thinking or doing or feeling, um, you know, the more potential agency we give them in the world. Right. right. And, um, and I have a student this semester who uh, he's, uh, he wrote uh, the first papers on uh, we did a rhetorical analysis of an existing monument. Um, and it is, uh, without a doubt, the best undergraduate paper I've ever read. Right. Wow. Uh, in my 15 years of teaching, uh, I'm just blown away. It's fantastic. Uh, and he's really great at the analysis part. The next assignment was a digital narrative that weaves together like familial story with cultural value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he said he was having he's having trouble how to balance the voice because he's being asked to write in visuals and a different style than what mm-hmm. he's normally used to. Um, but he spent tons and tons of hours on it because it was fun to try and work through which visuals go where, how does the story uh-huh. unfold, where do I, you know, uh, and to see somebody like this student who is an incredible student uh, across the board, but to talk about the struggles of doing things that are outside of what he's been traditionally asked to do. To me, it was a, like, I'm like, if I do nothing else as a teacher, I've won this week, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And then, and again, as we moved into uh, the, they had created an uh, online digital monument for something that they were monumentalizing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a different mode again, and he's trying to figure this out and, and struggling. Him and a couple other students were talking about, you know, I know how to make a video. I know how to write a paper, but this is different and mm-hmm. it's fun. And I spent 10 hours trying to figure out how to make two buttons work, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they weren't, they weren't complaining about it. They were talking about the importance of working, the fun of working that process and trying to figure out how these things change the way people receive their information or their engagement or how it creates meaning. And, um, you know, when I see that, I think maybe I am making a few right choices along the mm. way. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think, so I think I'm, I'm with you. I think the more we can encourage students to do this kind of work uh, and give them opportunities to do it, I think it's sort of, um, it pays for itself. It's, it, it quickly becomes self-evident in its value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think your, your tips here are, are fantastic. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No problem. No, no, I don't, don't, don't want that to go to your head. Yeah. yeah I don't, <laughs> these are, these are horrible tips. Let's take them off the screen. Yes. Now. Yes. Um, Just no, they're, they're really, they're really great. Uh, and, um, and so much more, uh, well, it's a nice, concise sort of set of steps. Like I'm always like, yeah, just go make something, figure it out. It's great. You know? And, and you're like, no, there should be steps along the process. Um, it's the difference between organization and disorganization as they say. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a, this, this is fantastic. Are, are there anything, anything else that you want to add? Anything you want to share with our viewers? Any last tidbits and thoughts that I should communicate to them about you? But it's just really cool to see what students are able to create and how their creativity really just like, for example, I had a whole classroom full of basically just engineers. And a lot of them told me, April talked about this in her segment as well. They, they say, I'm not creative. Like, I, I don't You're right. do these types of things. And then next thing you know, they're doing stop motion animations. Like yeah. I didn't tell them to do any of those things. <laughs> it's just like this idea that they yeah. had in their brain and they thought that this is the most effective way to communicate this information. So yeah, and then you have students who are going to med school or who want to be dentists and they're making 
stuff that is just so 100% them. I had one student who was just like, you know, I want to talk to a younger audience. I'm going to make a tutorial on how to ride a hoverboard. <laughs> and the cool thing was, even though it was a, a fun, semi-silly thing, the way she did it, like the way that she cut things, the way that she storyboarded that entire process was so amazing, like strategic. Everything was planned. And the fact that she was able to make it look so natural, that she was able to inject the video with her own personality and still um, get all of those steps in a very systematic way. It's just so well done. So I'd like That's to share great. those things with all yeah, of you. Yeah, no, send them along uh, or send links to them. I'll, I'll put them on the yeah. screen. We can share with folks. You know, one, it's uh, a couple of things. One, one question people ask me a lot is, uh, do you have any examples that I can share with my mm -hmm. students, right? Yeah. And I'm always like, well, of course, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I started the jump, the journal for undergraduate multimedia projects mm -hmm. just because of this particular thing because I kept having students do amazing work, right, like you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, other people should see this, but there was no place for them to go other than YouTube, oh. right? And YouTube's yeah. a big competitive space. So right. uh, we started a journal to showcase that. But yeah, anytime that I can share student work and help others see examples of what's possible and what really um, mm -hmm. Um, amazing projects people do. Uh, I'm happy to do that. So we'll, we'll put on the screen, we'll put links to your, to your website um, so they can visit you. If they want to contact you, they can reach out uh, through that information. Um, but otherwise, also, I think it's, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, my students, they, they gave their consent to share these videos. They're just like, yes, make us famous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good to know. Work. <laughs> right, right. So, well, yeah. that's why, yeah, that's why I usually share with the, the jump because they, you know, they have to sort of give up that right to make it, they to sort of not give up. They, they willingly allow yeah. us to make it public that they've done this work from a class. It's in, mm -hmm. uh, it's part of their course. So they they knowingly do that. So I think it's good that you mentioned that. Otherwise people might've sent me notes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and this is, it's all about them. Like this is 100% them. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate your time today. Uh, if, you know, if there's anything else that we forget, feel free to send it to me later and I'll add it to the mix. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you know, well, hopefully you'll tune in for our future episodes. I don't know what's next, but we'll see what's, what's coming down the pipeline. Um, and sure. as always, if, if viewers have comments, ideas, thoughts, suggestions, uh, let us know. We'll, we'll add them to our mix and we will see if we can get them into our rotation. So thank you for your time today, Shauna. Sounds good. Oh, thank you so much for having me.